Hello and welcome to the next installment of TI Precision Labs. In today's session I will be covering current feedback amplifiers. In this video I will discuss how current feedback amplifiers or CFPs differ from the more common voltage feedback amplifiers or VFPs. I will also discuss the differences in the architecture between the two types of amplifiers, how to compensate a current feedback op amp and finally, when best to use a current feedback op amp. Before I get into the details of current feedback op amps, I should clarify a couple of points. The equations used to determine the signal gain of a current feedback amplifier are the same as those used for a voltage feedback amplifier. The gain of an amplifier in the non-inverting configuration is 1 plus RF over RG where RF is a feedback resistor and RG is a gain resistor. Similarly, the gain of an amplifier in the inverting configuration is minus RF over RG. A current feedback op amp is always configured in a negative feedback loop and the virtual ground concept still holds true. That is, the voltage at the non-inverting input V in plus is equal to the voltage at the inverting input V in minus. Let's now discuss why we need to consider an alternate amplifier architecture to the traditional voltage feedback amplifier. A current feedback amplifier has two primary benefits over a voltage feedback amplifier. A CFB does not adhere to the constant gain bandwidth product relationship that a voltage feedback amplifier follows. The table shown here illustrates the difference between the two architectures. In unity gain configuration, both amplifiers have a bandwidth of 100 MHz. When the gain is increased to 10 volts per volt or 20 dB, the voltage feedback amplifier's bandwidth will reduce to 10 MHz while the ideal current feedback amplifier bandwidth does not change. Because of the gain bandwidth product independence, a current feedback op amp is an appropriate fit in applications that require large levels of signal gain or in programmable gain applications where the bandwidth of the amplifier remains constant irrespective of the gain configuration. The second benefit of the current feedback amplifier architecture is its ability to achieve much higher slew rates compared to voltage feedback amplifiers. The slew rate of an op amp is defined as the maximum rate of change of an op amp's output voltage and is measured in units of volts per microsecond. The slew rate of an amplifier is important because it determines the amplifier's large signal bandwidth, which is sometimes referred to as a full power bandwidth. The relationship between an amplifier's slew rate and its full power bandwidth is shown here in this equation. Because of its superior slew rate performance, current feedback amplifiers are used in applications that require a high speed, large signal, linear output such as DSL line drivers and arbitrary waveform generators. A conventional voltage feedback amplifier consists of a high input impedance differential stage followed by additional gain stages and a final low output impedance output stage. As shown in the figure, the voltage feedback amplifier senses the differential error voltage between its inputs and amplifies it by the open loop gain or AOL. Using control theory, the closed loop gain is given by the equation shown here. Notice that the term in the denominator is in fact the low frequency noise gain of the amplifier. Also notice that in the above equation, the minus 3 dB bandwidth of the amplifier is given at the point where the magnitude of the open loop gain is equal to the noise gain. The body plot shows the magnitude of the open loop gain and noise gain. Remember that the closed loop bandwidth of the amplifier is a frequency where AOL is equal to 1 plus RF over RG or the frequency at which the two curves intersect on the body plot. This intersection is also called the loop gain crossover point. 
As the magnitude of the signal gain and consequently the noise gain increases, the two curves will intersect at a lower frequency. Conversely, as the signal gain decreases, the curves will intersect at a higher frequency. This relationship is responsible for giving voltage feedback op amps their constant gain bandwidth product behavior. A simplified block diagram of a current feedback amplifier is shown here. Notice that the internal block diagram of a current feedback amplifier differs from its voltage feedback counterpart in two ways. A current feedback amplifier's input structure consists of a buffer between its non-inverting and inverting inputs. The gain of the buffer is represented by alpha and is approximately equal to 1. Ri shown here is the output resistance of the buffer and plays an important role in the amplifier's dynamic performance. A second point of contrast between the two amplifier types is that a current feedback op amp amplifies the error current IN at its inverting input while the voltage feedback op amp amplifies the error voltage between its inputs. I will explain the error current concept in detail in the subsequent slides. Since the current feedback op amp converts an error current into an output voltage, its internal open loop gain is represented by a transimpedance gain stage denoted by ZOL. This is analogous to the open loop voltage gain, AOL, of a conventional voltage feedback amplifier. A derivation for the closed loop gain of a current feedback amplifier is shown here. The loop gain term in the denominator is a function of the transimpedance open loop gain ZOL, the feedback resistance RF, the inverting input resistance RI, and the noise gain. The term RF plus RI times the noise gain is referred to as the feedback transimpedance of the current feedback op amp. The effect of the feedback transimpedance of a current feedback amplifier on its loop gain is analogous to the effect of the noise gain of a voltage feedback amplifier on its loop gain. While a VFP's loop gain is dependent solely on its noise gain, in the case of a current feedback amplifier, the loop gain is dominated by the feedback resistance and the noise gain has a secondary effect. This concept is best explained through the use of a numerical example. The feedback resistance RF can range from a few hundred ohms to a few kilo ohms, while RI is usually in the range of a few tens of ohms. For example, if RF is equal to 1 kilo ohm and RI is equal to 50 ohms, and the amplifier is configured in a gain of 5, then the feedback transimpedance will be 1.25 kilo ohms. The noise gain scaling term, 250 ohms in this case, has a relatively insignificant effect on the magnitude of the numerator in the loop gain equation. Similar to the case of a voltage feedback amplifier, the 3 dB bandwidth of the amplifier is determined by the frequency where the numerator and denominator term in the loop gain equation becomes equal. Thus, for small values of gain, the feedback resistance will be, do will be the dominant factor in the numerator of the loop gain term and will thus determine the bandwidth of a current feedback amplifier. For the rest of this discussion, I will assume that the amplifier is configured in the non-inverting mode, thus making the closed loop signal gain equal to the noise gain. Remember that in the inverting mode the noise gain is equal to 1 plus the magnitude of the inverting signal gain. This figure shows the small signal frequency response of the THS3091, a high voltage low distortion current feedback amplifier. The THS3091's frequency response was measured as a function of its closed loop gain which was varied from 0 dB to 20 dB. The closed loop bandwidth of the THS3091 remains almost constant at around 200 MHz irrespective of its closed loop gain. Let us now study the body plot of a current feedback amplifier. The ZOL curve 
shown here in red, has a low frequency dominant pole and a high frequency second order pole shown by the broken red line. The higher order pole reduces the phase margin in the same way that a higher order AOL pole reduces the phase margin of a voltage feedback amplifier. The feedback transimpedance is also shown in blue. As the closed loop gain of a current feedback amplifier is increased, the total feedback transimpedance will also increase because of the finite value of Ri. This increase is more pronounced at the higher gains where the product of Ri and the noise gain will be on par with the feedback resistance. The increase in feedback transimpedance will raise the blue curve, thus causing the loop gain crossover to occur at a lower frequency. An increase in the feedback transimpedance increases the phase margin and reduces the closed loop bandwidth of the amplifier. In order to maintain a constant phase margin and bandwidth across gain, the feedback transimpedance should be kept constant. This is achieved by lowering the feedback resistance as the closed loop gain is increased. Be cautious when configuring the amplifier in very high gains since one may be tempted to keep reducing the value of feedback resistance. However, remember that the feedback network is in parallel with the output load resistance and reducing RF will increase the loading on the amplifier's output. The effective load on the amplifier's output is given by this equation. For example, in a gain of 10, the effective load on the output of the THS3091 will be 89.6 ohms instead of 100 ohms. In summary, the feedback resistance is an integral part of the loop gain equation. Hence, the feedback resistance recommended in the data sheet should be adhered to in order to preserve stability. This figure shows the small signal frequency response of the THS3091 when the gain is kept constant and the feedback resistance is varied. The nominal feedback resistance is 1.21 kilo ohms. With a smaller value of RF, the feedback transimpedance is reduced, thus reducing the phase margin and increasing the bandwidth of the amplifier. The reduction in phase margin is apparent because of the peaking in the amplifier's frequency response. Similarly, when the value of RF is increased over the recommended value in the datasheet, the feedback transimpedance gets larger, thus increasing the phase margin and decreasing the bandwidth. In this manner, a current feedback op-amp can be compensated for any arbitrary phase margin by changing the feedback resistance. In order to simplify the circuit design for the customer, current feedback amplifier data sheets have a graph or a table which shows the recommended value of feedback resistance as a function of the noise gain. An example graph for the OPA691 is shown here. Remember that in order to maintain a constant bandwidth across gain, the feedback transimpedance should be kept constant. Based on this graph, we can then extract the value of Ri by substituting the values for gain and RF for two different gain configurations. For example, substituting the value of feedback resistance from the graph in a gain of 2 and 5 respectively into the feedback transimpedance equation and equating the two results in an RI of 33.33 ohms. This value matches quite closely with the specified 35 ohms in the electrical characteristics table of the datasheet. Once the value of RI is known, the targeted feedback transimpedance for a CFB can be determined using the now familiar equation. In the case of the OPA691, the target feedback transimpedance is 470 ohms. The closed loop bandwidth of a current feedback amplifier can be estimated from the open loop transimpedance curve once the target feedback transimpedance is known. The OPA691's target feedback transimpedance 
was calculated in the previous slide to be around 470 ohm or 53.4 dB ohm. As shown in the figure above, the intersection between 54 dB ohm and the ZOL curve occurs around 100 MHz. The electrical characteristics table in the data sheet, however, specifies the bandwidth in a gain of 2 to be 190 MHz. There are a few reasons for the discrepancy between the measured value of 190 MHz and the calculated value of 100 MHz. The equation for the feedback transimpedance is based on a single pole first order system. However, the open loop ZOL curve shown is that of a second order system as evident by the 180 degree phase shift in the amplifier's open loop phase response. The reduction in phase margin in a second order system will extend the closed loop bandwidth of the amplifier and is partially responsible for the increase in bandwidth from 100 MHz to 190 MHz. Another reason for the discrepancy between theory and measurement is that the value of Ri is not constant across frequency and amplitude while the calculation so far assumed Ri to be constant at 35 ohms. Input capacitance is inherent to an op amp's internal architecture and is also present as a parasitic in the PCB traces. The input capacitance interacts with the feedback resistance to create a zero in the noise gain response which consequently introduces a zero in the feedback transimpedance as shown here. The trace capacitance can be minimized by removing the PCB ground plane around the inverting terminal. As discussed previously, in order to maintain a constant feedback transimpedance across gain, RF must be increased as the gain is reduced. The increased RF at lower signal gains results in a reduced zero frequency. A zero in the noise gain response is a pole in the loop gain response. Remember that a pole in the loop gain response reduces the amplifier's phase margin. To counter the effect of the zero, a pole can be introduced into the feedback transimpedance curve by adding a feedback capacitance CF in parallel with RF. This compensation technique is similar to the lead lag technique commonly used to stabilize voltage feedback op amps. Now, the next point is very important. Do not add a feedback capacitor unless the circuit analysis requires it. If the input capacitance is negligible and a large feedback capacitance is added, then the pole will occur before the zero as shown here. The net effect of the pole occurring before the zero is a reduction in the feedback transimpedance which causes the loop gain crossover to occur closer to the higher order ZOL pole which reduces the amplifier's phase margin. The feedback resistance used at a given closed loop gain should not be too far below the recommended value in the datasheet since this can cause the loop gain crossover to occur after the higher order ZOL pole thus reducing the phase margin as shown here. When configuring the amplifier as a unity gain buffer one may be tempted to set the feedback resistance RF equal to 0 ohms and thus short the output of the amplifier to its inverting input like a traditional voltage feedback amplifier. A feedback resistance of 0 ohms will cause the loop gain crossover to occur after the second pole in the ZOL curve, greatly reducing the amplifier's phase margin and should thus be avoided. The datasheet of a current feedback op-amp usually specifies the feedback resistance to be used in unity gain configurations. So, to highlight some of the key factors to keep in mind when designing systems that use current feedback amplifiers. Pay attention to the datasheet recommended values of feedback resistance when using CFBs. By maintaining a constant value of feedback transimpedance, a CFB is capable of holding a constant bandwidth and phase margin across gain. Thank you for your time and please take the quiz.